Hello. How's it going? Welcome to the Green Space. I'm Jennifer. I work here. Um, how many of you are here for the first time ever? Wow, nice. How'd you hear about this show? This gentleman right here. He is our director of marketing, ladies and gentlemen. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, thank you. Um, that's really great. A one-man marketing machine. Well, I'm glad you're here. So the rest of you are regs. Has anyone been to see the civilian's residency already in this round? Nice. Nice, yeah. The bad kids in the back of the bus, huh? Yeah, I like it. All right. Well, welcome back. Welcome. Um, the Green Space is where you are. We're part of New York Public Radio. If you listen to WNYC or WQXR or listen to any of our podcasts like Radio Lab or On the Media, you know us in audio form. But we don't just sit in studios upstairs and talk into these tubes. Sometimes we do it in front of people. And that's why we're here tonight. Um, so you can see it all live. This show tonight could only really happen here because you have these brilliant artists from the civilians getting into the studio very literally with brilliant journalists like Brian Lehrer. You guys know the Brian Lehrer show? So that, that's how this all happened. Um, it's really cool. I'm hoping maybe they'll consent to doing an album together. Um, Brian does have a burgeoning rap career that not a lot of people know about. <laughs> But uh, seriously, look it up on our website. He recently rapped on live radio, um, and I think that could be cool. Anyway, I hope you'll come back to the green space again. We have more theater coming up this week with Theater of Wars. David Strathairn will be here with a bunch of other great actors. We've got a classical music show in tribute to Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, so that's really cool coming up next week, and a whole show about sexual wellness centered on the clitoris. There will be a giant inflatable clitoris <laughs> in our lobby. So if you've never seen one, <laughs> do whatever you want with that, right? Um, come on back. So get our newsletter, follow us on social, etc. cetera. Um, last but certainly not least, um, is anyone a member of New York Public Radio in the house? Members? Thank you, members. Thank you to Steinway also for sponsoring this beautiful piano and the Jerome L. Green Foundation. So the last thing to do, if you haven't already, just silence your phones. You can leave them on if you must, but just keep them on silent. And we're going to get going. I'm going to hand this over to the man behind all these plans. Seriously, four different people have told me this man is a genius, and none of them were him, his partner, his family. So I really think he might be Steve Cosson. Uh, uh, hello, hello. Thank you all so much for coming out. Um, uh, I'm Steve Cosson, uh, the artistic director of The Civilians. Uh, and is anyone here completely unfamiliar with what the civilians are? You have no clue in the least? Great. So um, that gives me reason to say who we are. We are uh, a New York theater company. Uh, we've been kicking around for about two decades. We create all types of shows, but we create mostly uh, investigations from real life. So uh, some of the work is verbatim documentary from interviews that we do. Sometimes it's research that then gets fictionalized uh, and turned into a show. We do musicals, we do straight plays, uh, and we do these kind of one-off crazy cabaret events like tonight. Uh, and uh, everything you, you will hear this evening uh, is verbatim from a call-in uh, to the Brian Lair show or an interview that we did uh, with some exceptions and I will explain that later <laughs> uh, but to uh, yeah let's get started so um, uh, the civilians the Brian Lair show joining together to make a wonderful work of theater <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah off with the show <laughs> Brian Lehrer on WNYC will end today with part two of our call-in on your biggest flops and fiascos. So who's got a good story? Well, this story, well, this story starts, starts on a dark and stormy night in downtown Brooklyn. And we would, take, we would take these mattresses all around and put them in various places, like on the beach. And I still hear her screaming. And it was one of those moments where you're like, please wake up, please wake up. <laughs> Hey, buddy, that's the best drag outfit I've ever seen. I loved my bicycle. And when I started bleeding, I pivoted completely. So the song was over, and I stood there, and stood there, 
And there was just absolute silence in the theater. I learned how to not, not do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, I learned how to not do it, for sure. It could have been a lot worse. I'm glad you survived getting hit by the truck, uh, for one thing. But thank you, and hang on. Uh, we'll take your contact information in case Steve and his colleagues at the Civilians want to turn that one into a song. Let's go next to Adele in Freehold. You're on WNYC. Hi, Adele. When I lived in Toronto, my mother-in-law's birthday was coming up, and I made a, a Schwarzfield Kirsten tort, sat on the floor, and watched my eight-layer black forest made from scotch cake because she loved chocolate, took it to her house the next day on a tear crystal cake plate with her son for brunch where she invited my mother. And I put this crystal cake plate, two-layer, two-level, with homemade cookies on the bottoms, mandel bread, and this Schwarzfeld Kirschentort on the top. And the cake is about, literally, you can't see it. It's very high, it's very impressive, chocolate swirls. I went downstairs to visit my father-in-law, who was in the basement putting up pickles. Hi, love, how are you? And all of a sudden, I will delete the swear words because I want you to think well of me. I want you to think I'm a nice lady. So we go downstairs, we go downstairs, and chatting for 10 seconds, she wasn't in the kitchen when I put it down. You hear, what the bleep is this? I don't want this bleeping cake. I wanted a mm -mm cake. I told you I wanted a pie. I wanted a mm -mm effing chocolate pie. And we all raise our chins up to the ceiling because we can't believe what's going on up there. What the, what psychosis happened from the bedroom to the kitchen? This is already a Michigas, abyssal Michigas. My father-in-law is very smart and he knows he's not going up those stairs, but the sacrificial stupid daughter-in-law lamb is going up the steps. And of course, the meek and mild never stood up to his mother husband. We go up the stairs and I'm ginger and I'm like, hi mom, hi, happy birthday. I don't want any mm, cake. I told you I wanted a mm, fucking pie. What the f am I gonna do with this cake? And I'm telling you, I, I, I said to her, mom, you know, you can't put candles in a pie. <laughs> and that point, Caligula stepped in and she picked up this double layer. I got it for my shower crystal cake plate and hurled it at me and I stood there frozen like someone had punched me in the face and looked down wondering is there an explanation for this um yeah well what so I um I kind of um I picked up my feet and where there wasn't I'm praying I wouldn't have crystal in my feet my crystal my chocolate and took myself to the bathroom and sat on the edge of the the bathtub, sobbing, I'm a young woman, I want her to like me, and I finish, and I'm worried that the chocolate is on the towels, and she's gonna be mad at me about the towels, and I come out, and my mother is walking, my mother is walking up the front cement steps, and Elaine, my mother-in-law, comes out of the kitchen and says, hi, friend, come in, yeah, the kids are here, come on in, come in, lunch is ready, like, like Jekyll and hide, 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 hide. No, I think Jekyll was the bad one. And my mother, who she brought a cake she made, so, uh, so there was a birthday cake, even though I had called my mother while sitting on the floor watching the Schwarzfield Kirschenter rise and rise and rise and rise. That, so help me, I have no reason to fib, not even exaggerate. I am not prone to exaggeration. That is every single word true. Uh, uh, great, thank you, Jenny. So uh, that was Adele, and we were so fond of Adele. We got her number, uh, and we called her up, and I got a little bit more information. So uh, you might be seeing more of her tonight. But um, that was that was <laughs> Adele number one, uh, and uh, this brings us up to our first song. Uh, this uh, this one did not make it onto the air, but you know the screeners kind of take notes uh, as to 
um, what the content of the call is supposed to be, and this one seemed interesting. Uh, so we gave a call to some guy named Steve. Is Steve here? Yeah, okay. <laughs> this is your song, you're gonna get played by a woman. Uh, <laughs> And uh, the song uh, is taken, again, verbatim from the interview. Um, Zach Zadek, uh, who is a composer we work with often, uh, wrote it into a song. And yeah, please uh, enjoy A Sheep and a Goat. I'm a retired science teacher. I taught high school for 28 years straight. My passion was the environmental thing until the April that I met my fate. Every Earth Day we planned a festival. I tried to make amazing things appear. Jugglers, performers, a bus that ran on olive oil. I wanted to outdo myself each year. Until, of course, that final year. A sheep and a goat, a sheep and a goat. I had a parent bring a sheep and a goat, a sheep and a goat. I thought to bring them here. The day goes on according to schedule. The kids all love their furry friends. As much as I would like to call it a success, I'm afraid that's not where the story ends. A sheep and a goat, a sheep and a goat, all delighted by a sheep and a goat, a sheep and a goat, until the sheep disappeared. A sheep and a goat, a sheep and a goat, the sheep went running, so never mind the goat. The principal shouts, he's getting out of here. That sheep is running across a major avenue. It wasn't funny. What the hell am I supposed to do? Get in my car. But that's no match for this sheep. That sheep is flying. I ditch my car right in the street. All traffic grinds straight to a halt. Now I'm on foot chasing this sheep. A kid from our high school's football team tackles the beast down to its knees. A Verizon truck is parked along the sea. I scream out, please, I need your help. Come take this sheep. <laughs> we all return to school. <laughs> By now, the bell has rung. The students wait with bated breath to find out what Earth Day has become. A sheep, a sheep, I came back with a sheep. A sheep is how I saved the day. A sheep and a goat, a sheep and a goat, thank God the principal found us a rope. A sheep and a goat is how I saved the day. Everybody now! A sheep and a goat, a sheep and a goat, thank God the principal found us a rope. A sheep and a goat is how I saved the day. A sheep and a goat, a sheep and a goat, thank God the principal found us a rope. And that was my favorite Earth Day. Uh, great. So um, I wanted just to clarify something here. It's probably obvious, but you never know. Uh, so when you see the actors wearing headphones, as Robert is doing right now, uh, that means the real audio from the Brian Lair show is being piped directly 
into his ears. So these are not, not memorized, uh, really. Uh, it's going uh, from the ear, like, like right out of the voice of the actor in some kind of Vulcan mind meld kind of <laughs> arrangement here. Yeah, uh, and uh, again, everything is real except when it's not. So to explain <laughs> that a little bit, uh, there, there were a few call-ins where we, we kind of just wanted to get a little inventive. Uh, so I asked the playwright James Labella to take uh, a look, and, and then, you know, he went a little wild here and there. <laughs> um, but we don't want to confuse you, so whenever we veer off from reality, we're going to give you a clue and that the room will become kind of pink. Can, can, we, can we see that, that pink cue? Yeah, yeah, so register this. Take it in. If you see pink, don't, don't, um, don't trust your ears. Uh, did I forget anything? No, okay, back to Brian Lair, back to you. Should we just jump into one? Please. David in Glen Ridge, you're on WNYC. Hi, David, thank you for calling in. Hey, uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. I had a, a sort of, I was blessed. My father-in-law is a dead ringer for uh, Bernard Madoff. <laughs> Looks just like him. And uh, 2000, when the crash happened, 2008, and Wall Street got bailed out, everybody got bailed out, there was quite a bit of anger, especially anger on my part. Uh, I thought I would harness some of that anger, and I created a website that was Wall Street Sucks with an X. <laughs> dot com. I made t shirts, uh, car magnets, uh, little badges, all kinds of stuff. I spent a few grand. Uh, I still have every single one of them. I, I can't bring myself to throw them out. So. But the concept for the website is you could pay, you know, a certain amount of money and I'll humiliate my father-in-law for, you know, like uh, I could uh, throw a pie at him or, or pull his pants down or something and I'll send you a video of it and we, my father-in-law and I, would split the profit. You thought you were going to make money. Uh, yeah. I thought I was going to make a fortune. I was ready to quit my job. Yet this was going to be my retirement fund. You know, a lot of people really angry about the bailout, you know? It was, it was a total bust, though. Only one guy responded. We made one sale. And this guy asked for a video of my father-in-law running absolutely fast as he could into a banana peel. <laughs> Just, like, totally sprint. You know, and he was meant to slide on the peel into a wall of, you, you know those suction cups with the hooks? Yeah, in a wall of those, <laughs> suction cup side out. And, and you know, the idea was that maybe uh, there was some spit or blood or, or, or something would travel down the cups like a big Plinko board. You, you, you remember Plinko? Yeah, and we had to line up a bunch of dog bowls to collect it. I, I mean, sorry if any of you are squeamish, but uh, dog bowls to collect any uh, fluids. The cashier at Petco was so weird, and I was like, sorry, lady, Wall Street sucks. Um, so we used eyelash glue to get the suction cups to stay, a and we couldn't get it. We couldn't get the shot. Again and again, I mean, he would just, he would, you, you know, he would hurl his body at this thing and, and flip over and, and get, you know, he was pretty, he was fucked up by the end of it, you know. We went through a few bunches of bananas, I think. But, you know, it was our only sale. <laughs> I got very curious later, the guy who asked for that, he, he was a, it was a throwaway email, you know. I tracked down the IP and I saw that it was some retiree from Wisconsin. You know what's crazy? He looked exactly like my father-in-law. Do you, do, do you want to ask uh, David any follow-up question there, Steve? Uh, no, no. <laughs> well, I was, I was angry about it. The bailout, you know? I was just angry. But why are they bailing them out? I need money. 
You know, I was in a, obviously a different place at the time. And I, I learned later that my father-in-law actually lost a small fortune because of it. Okay, uh, so um, for our, our next performance, we're going to take uh, just a little detour away from the Brian Lair show, uh, and we're going to dig back into the civilians' archives, because uh, we have been doing this, as I mentioned, for a couple of decades, and uh, we interview people and create shows about all types of subject matter, like not just public humiliation <laughs> and failure, uh, but we did uh, uh, an, an evening at Joe's Pub some years ago on the theme of weddings uh, and you're going to hear some from that and then I don't even remember which one this is from but there's a, a, a wonderful uh, story of um, a performance gone wrong uh, and it will help if you are familiar with the Japanese dance theater tradition known as Buto. Any, any, anyone familiar with Buto? Okay, s a smattering, anyhow. So we have, for those of you who are not, uh, we have a little clip, if we, could, if we could run that. Just not, this is not, not our interviewee's buto or our buto. Uh, this is just something I, I found on Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, great, so uh, yeah, got it, all makes sense, great. So uh, a little uh, buto flop with uh, Rebecca Hart. Um, I was interested in Butoh, uh, which I didn't really know much about, so I took a few workshops. And I really, really love it. And it's really raw. And it can look very, it can look very scary if you don't really know what you're looking at. And I really wanted to do a show, but I didn't know anybody. So I thought maybe I could do like a cool, kind of artsy, you know, edgy performance art thing, like outdoors in public <laughs> and um, you know it could have been good it could have been a good idea except <laughs> I didn't really do it the right way really honestly I um, <laughs> well okay so I, I put on all this makeup which was like totally goth inspired and it had like blood dripping from my eyes and it was really creepy and I like took a rose and I was like you know, slowly creeping toward the rose, and I was really feeling it. And one of the things we talked about with performance art was like, if you're going to do a piece in public, you have to be willing to endure people's reactions. Like, the show must go on. But, so, um, so these two like men come up to me, and, and they start asking me questions, like, um, oh, are you okay, and stuff like that. <laughs> and 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 I just keep going because this is art with a capital A. And then they start trying to help me up and, and I'm resisting them. And then they're like, whoa, she's so strong. And I'm like, wow, this is cool. And, and then one of them takes out a walkie talkie and is like, hey, you know, we got someone here. I'm not sure what's going on. Maybe they're on drugs or maybe they're having a seizure. And I'm like, oh my God, he's calling 911. And that's when I realized that these two guys are cops in like, you know, ordinary civilian clothes. So I get in the ambulance <laughs> and um, one of the cops comes in and he starts talking to me about how, you know, super, super wrong it is to call 911 when there's not actually an emergency. It is a felony. And I start crying um, because like crying always helps. I mean, I mean, if you are a small white female person, the cops are nicer to you if you cry. And I'm like, oh my God, I am so sorry. I had no idea. I was just trying to do this art thingy and my teacher said, you have to keep going and I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And they did not arrest me. Ugh. And you know, and I'm sure if I had been any other race or gender, this could have been a very, very bad story, but uh, they all left. And did I go home? No. I was like, I'm gonna finish it. So, so I start, you know, working on it again. And, um, and then someone else comes out and it's like 
like a really nice person, like a really, really nice person. And she's like, um, hi, I have a classroom full of ESL students on the second floor of that building, and they can see you, and, and they're really worried about you. Um, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. But I remember I was like really mad that nobody like understood me. <laughs> I guess I was hoping that people would watch and, well, look, it was an experiment. It was an experiment to see how people would react to someone with a lot of makeup on moving really slowly. <laughs> and I guess the result of that experiment was that people thought it was a medical emergency. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so in this spirit of experimentation, uh, you know, every one of these residencies that we've, every performance we have done in our residency here at the Green Space uh, has been a bit of an experiment. We've been trying to do things uh, different. Uh, and for this next part of the show, uh, we are going to extend that experimentation uh, to you, our audience. So I just, I need two eager, carefree volunteers from the audience. One, great, come on up. And I just need one more, one more person. Don't be shy. You're not going to make this person do everything yourself. Great, here. <laughs> Number two. Um, great, hi, what's your name? Sherry. Sherry. Great to meet you. So you can head to that mic right over there. Uh, and why don't you come over here? And what's your name? John. John, great. Uh, hang back for just a second. Uh, so uh, these are the translated lyrics to the, um, to the national anthem of Armenia. <laughs> and if you feel like improvising a melody, sure. yeah, you're up for it? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> Just acapella, right? Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> Our fatherland, free and independent, that lived from century to century. His children are calling, free, independent Armenia. Here, brother, for you, a flag that I made with my hands. Nights I didn't sleep with my tears. I washed it. Look at it, three colors. It's our gifted symbol. Let it shine against the enemy. Let Armenia be glorious. Everywhere, death is the same. Everyone dies only once. But, lu <laughs> but lucky is the one who is sacrificed for his nation. Wow. But lucky is the one who is sacrificed for his nation. Okay. So you're up next, no pressure, no pressure. Uh, and uh, again, uh, you know, if you, oh, yep, a little technical, technical help there, thank you, thank you, Heath. Can we get you for me later? Right? <laughs> uh, so yeah, if, um, if you are inspired with a, a, a melody, go for it. Uh, and if it, if it doesn't come for you, you can just give us a dramatic reading. Um, but this is the actual national anthem of Iceland. <laughs> oh, God of our land, oh, our land's God, we worship thy holy, holy name. From the solar systems of the heavens, <laughs> bind you for a wreath, your warriors the assembly of the ages. <laughs> for thee is one day as a thousand years, and a thousand years a day, and no more. <laughs> one small flower of eternity with a quivering tear that prays 
to its God and dies. Iceland's thousand years, Iceland's thousand years, one small flower of eternity with a quivering tear that prays to its God and dies. Well, uh, uh, experiment successful. <laughs> Thank you both so much. You were fantastic. Uh, and the, that little moment was uh, actually kind of a warm up for our next song, uh, which is written by uh, Ella Rose Chari and uh, Brandon James Gwynn, who are pictured up here. Uh, and uh, Heath, Heath Saunders here in, uh, in center mic is going to take the lead. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just riffing until you're, until you're all settled. <laughs> uh, great. Take it away. Ryan in Pittsburgh has another on stage fiasco. Ryan, you're on WNYC. Hi there. Brian, 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 Long time listener, long time listener, long time listener, live on the radio, live on the radio, live on the radio. So my story, I'm actually a classical musician now, but in high school I was also a singer. I was asked to sing the national anthem and O oh Canada at a local hockey match in front of 3,000 people. 3,000 people! And live on the radio, live on the radio, live on the radio! The problem is I did not know O oh Canada. I spent the entire day learning it. I thought it would be no problem. Sang it probably a thousand times. I get to the arena. Get to the they arena. They tell me I'm singing a cappella. Singing a cappella. In front of 3,000 people and live on the radio. Live on the radio. I bring a little cheat sheet that has all the words. So I'm staring at the words. I get three, three notes in. in. In front of 3,000 people. 3,000 people. Three, three notes in. in. And forget the melody. So I made it up in front of 3,000 people. About three notes just over and over and over and over and oh, Canada. Oh, Canada. Our homeland, our native land, true patriot. Oh, Canada. 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 Oh, 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 Canada. Oh, 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 Canada. Oh, 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 Canada. Oh, 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 Canada. In front of 3,000 people. 3,000 people. And live on the radio. Live on the radio. Live on the radio. It was one of those moments when you're like, please wake up. Please wake up! <laughs> That's a and great people's. story. Hang on. We're going to take your contact information off the air in case they want to turn that one into a song, which uh, Robert Johansson sounds like it might make a pretty good song. Oh, yeah, yeah. Some variation on O Canada. <laughs> With the hockey rink and everything. Uh, that, that could be a good one. Ending, so that cute. Was a so we're fiasco. doing it again. That was not the end of the <laughs> that song. That was not the end of the song. <laughs> so we're going to actually sing the end of the song. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, 
from where? Uh, people still make fun of me. It, people still make fun of me for what just happened, <laughs> which is when I messed up the music to Oh Canada. Are we back in yeah. the space? Okay. Brian. 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 We're running out of time, so we're not going to get to the story of sheep escaping. <laughs> We are not gonna get to the sheep. 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 Live on the radio. Live on the radio. Live on the radio. And this is the Brian Lair voiceover about the next caller. And we're going to go next to Mark in the West Village, who oh was also uh, at a law firm for this flop or fiasco, right, Mark? Hi, Brian. Yes, it looks like there's a lot of uh, legal instances that led to some flops and fiascos. At the time, this is several years ago. I was a junior lawyer. I'm in a trial at the Southern District of New York before the great judge, Jed Rakoff, uh, who happened to be wearing a tuxedo that day because the trial had been so long and this was the final day of the trial. The courtroom is packed. I'm sitting in counsel table uh, next to a very uh, fantastic, bombastic New York lawyer, whose name you know, who's doing the closing argument. I have one job as the junior lawyer sitting at the counsel table, and that is to keep track of the time. I'm so burnt out from working a 100 hour work week that week, preparing for the trial. I have no idea how much time has passed. The, the fantastic lawyer turns to me and says, Mark, how much time is left? I freeze. I have no idea. The courtroom is silent, dead silent. And after what felt like about an hour, but was probably 10 seconds, he asks again, well, Mark, I'm silent. And all of a sudden, the judge begins to absolutely sob. My wedding, my wedding. He's crying so hard he can barely breathe in his tuxedo. I look over at the lawyer and he points to the gallery. There's a group of men all in tuxedos. They all look alike, thin, shiny hair, and they're shaking their heads in unison, tisk, tisk, tisk. And this judge, he's crying, 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 silver tears. I guess those men were his groomsmen I guess he was meant to get married right after the trial. And, be, and because I had lost track of time, he missed the ceremony. <laughs> the bride thought she had been left at the altar, and she never spoke to him again. Yeah, I didn't expect gasps for that one. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was good. OK, so. Uh, that was from the Brian Leo show, and you know one thing I don't, I don't know if I said it at the top of the the evening, but just to give you a sense of the of the uh, past couple of weeks we've had, we went on the Brian Leo show uh, at the very end of April, I think it was the 25th and the 27th. Uh, got transcriptions from those calls farmed them out to songwriters who then wrote songs very quickly, and then we've been here for a few days to rehearse the show. Uh, and that's uh, which obviously is going off without a hitch, and so far, <laughs> not a single, a single mistake. <laughs> uh, and then, because uh, <laughs> this was the moment where I was gonna warn you that things might get a little rocky. Uh, <laughs> Because, so the next uh, story you're about to hear is from an older civilian's cabaret we did at Joe's Pub. Uh, this was the weddings, the wedding show. Uh, so the, uh, the interview is from a few years ago, uh, but the song is about 48 hours old, uh, um, composed by uh, Heath down here at the end. Uh, and then, uh, the uh, brilliant and talented Maya Sharp has gotten uh, one rehearsal <laughs> for this wonderful epic song. 
Um, so you might see her like you know looking looking at her script, <laughs> uh, uh, follow, following it, following along in the music. Uh, but uh, yeah, we rehearsed this uh, just a few hours ago for the very first time. So uh, think positive thoughts, beam them all up on stage, and then uh, it's all gonna be great. Here we are. Oh God, my sister was so in love can I speak freely? She was so in love with this nigga. They were so in love. They went and bought some property. They're having this log cabin built. They're gonna live this glamorous life and all this BS. They bought cars and, and put everything in his name. She didn't want to be. About a year and a half, maybe two years into the relationship, he asked her to marry her. And she didn't want to be no white virgin bride. She wanted something different and elegant. Said she wanted a white carriage ride Like the queen that she is She had gone and got this dress made Made out of all kinds of peachy orange Big ass orangey peachy dress made She had jewels all sewn in it that was some funny shit. She had gone and got this big or ass orangey dress, wedding dress made. And we called it Great Pumpkin Dress. Cause that's what she looked like in that shit. Great Pumpkin Dress. <laughs> so I'm fixing the food that Saturday when we were doing the wedding. It was like August. It was still hot. She had like 10 bridesmaids, 10 groomsmen. Huge wedding party. I knew how to make weddings and stuff, so I set up the cake, set up the food, and I'm propping this last tablecloth. And so the ceremony is getting ready to start, and they were playing the music, and everybody was getting lined up on the steps outside the church. And I'd seen a tuxedo going down the street. Who the hell is leaving now? But then I go so I can see who it is. Hmm. It was Charles, the groom. So I said, hell no. I said, Ronnie, that's my brother. Ronnie, Charles left. And he's like, no, he didn't. And I said, what the hell you think? And I'm like, oh shit, I can't let my sister walk down the aisle. She expects this man to show up, Ronnie. This nigga just left. So I went into the building to tell her. And then Edwina, this evangelist or whatever the hell she's supposed to be, she turns to me and says, no, you can't get in there. We're getting ready to start the ceremony. <laughs> Look, move the fuck out of the way. I need to talk to my sister. No, you can't go in there. I said, mm -mm. Edwina, now I'm trying to be nice to you. And I ain't been saved all my life, so you know you need to get the fuck out of my way. Because, Edwina, this nigga just left. And I just kind of went around and, and, and went in there, and, and there was my sister. And I told her, mm. That nigga just stood your ass up and then I left. <laughs> and there was three, four hundred people in that church. It was packed. Edwina had to go down there and tell them, I, I'm sorry, the wedding has been canceled. 
<laughs> and she was, you know, she was a high yellow and she, her eyes was beet red. And after that, we all just, you know, went to my sister's house and just had a party there. Mm. We all got drunk and we stayed drunk for two days. Everybody was drunk. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody. Yes. Let me tell you something. All that property, all them cars that she and he had bought together, every single thing. She didn't get nothing. She got no thing. She went down to the courthouse, tried to get, get papers and stuff. After she had gotten annulled, they told her were nothing they could do because nothing was in her name. She was really embarrassed. She left church after that because she was a member and people were making fun of her. But who has an orange wedding dress? She didn't want to be no white virgin bride. She wanted something different and elegant. Said she wanted that white carriage ride. She didn't have the horse, the carriage, but that's what she wanted. To be like a princess. <laughs> she had that frog. That nigga was a frog. I'm sorry. Oh, I, 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 that's that's what my brother told me. Yeah, that frog didn't kiss your ass, mm -mm. and you didn't wake up. Oh man, we, we we talk shit to her. Yeah, it was bad. It was bad. <laughs> But it was funny as hell. <laughs> Brian Lehrer on WNYC. Now to your flops and fiascos at work. Hillary in White Plains, you're on WNYC. Thanks for calling in. Hi. Hi, Brian. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I have a funny story that's kind of a get your first job out of college. And um, I was um, working with a temp company and hoping to be hired by this law firm. And I'd been there about a week, I guess. And it was kind of my turn to do the dishes. I'd taken the last cup. It was an office protocol. And uh, this, the dishwasher, they had a dishwasher in this law firm. And I grew up without it one, which I can explain later. And um, anyway, there was a bottle under the sink, so I used that, and it turned out to be multi-purpose tile cleaner. And I was worried it wouldn't be enough because I'd never, you know, done something like this before, so I also threw in about two caps worth of bleach. And I turned on the dishwasher, and there was a horrible smell, so I left. And by the time I guess this thing was really cooking, um, somebody came in, I saw it, I heard this squeal, and um, I ran in, and I was like, oh my god, I think I did that. Hillary, you made mustard gas. Pretty much, yeah. I'm telling you, you made mustard gas. But No, but I didn't get fired. I just didn't get hired, because I was a temp. And, and I guess they, but you know, I grew up with a single mom in San Francisco, and when people say, you know, when I say we didn't have a dishwasher, they're like, you're kidding me. And I'm like, no, you're looking at her. So remember back a while ago, uh, we said that the story of Adele and the cake might reappear. Uh, so here it is for the uh, its second appearance. There might even be three, but this is the second there one. There might be. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is uh, Adele's story with a cake made into a song by uh, Julian Hornick, uh, the composer who is presently in the Civilians R&D Group Lab for new work, working on a brand new musical. 
Uh, and and then, yeah, it was kind enough to give us this song. So take it away. A two-layer crystal cake plate. I got it for my wedding shower. A two-layer crystal cake plate. Hurtling through the air at 10 miles an hour. Hurtling through the air. And it's just one second of my life. Mother, son, daughter-in-law, wife. The Gansha Mishpuka. Eight tiers of German chocolate. Each layer I did patiently watch rise. Now eight tiers of German chocolate Together as one flies Together as one And it's just one second Then it's done Mother-in-law, daughter-in-law, husband Good for nothing, meek little son Watch as a glorious, nearly victorious, attempt at ingratiation laborious, soars to goddamn high, then crashes down and makes me cry. Eight tears of German chocolate splattered all up my two stocking feet. I retreated to the bathroom to lick my wounds, which mercifully were chocolate sweet. <laughs> to lick my wounds. And it's just one cake among so many. I was and am a good baker, you should know. And just one mother-in-law is plenty and oh my god that woman could throw and we're going to go right on to Aaron in Brooklyn who looks like he has quite an unusual flop or fiasco for us. Hi Aaron. Hey Brian, thanks so much for having me. I love your show. Uh, I listen to you every day. So I was looking for a cheap alternative to housing and I bought a nine ten thousand dollar houseboat in Maryland. Up in Maryland. And I drove it up to New York City and I parked it down in Hoboken. And one day I was gonna fill the tanks of gas. I had three or four friends on the boat with me and we set out on the Hudson River just to fill up the tanks. Just to fill up the tanks. You know, and get a little get a little lunch maybe in Jersey City get ourselves a nice beautiful lunch in Jersey City well we lost the engine halfway in the middle of the river and all of a sudden I lose control of the boat I just can't control the thing and all of a sudden we're drifting closer and closer to Manhattan and what do you know we just start whacking into Pier 26 and spitting into the frying pan with hundreds of inebriated party goers just laughing taking pictures as we just sort of just get smashed into the pier we just get smashed into the pier we start floating north into our little cluster of sailing 
vessels the sailing school instructor what I presume is one is on the megaphone shouting I'm barking orders at my friends to push us away. We're floating in the midst of these sailboats, and I ended up calling a wonderful man, Dano. We got my little butt out of there. I kept the boat for about three, three more years. Then Hurricane Sandy kind of tanked that endeavor. I took all my belongings off of the boat, and everything got flooded in the marina. And I sold the boat for, you know, pennies on the dollar. Pennies on the dollar. Ooh. <laughs> Magnus in Brooklyn, you're on WNYC. Hi, Magnus. Hello, hello, hello. Brian. Hello, Brian. So, what was your well, my story? Oh, so, my story is, uh, uh, yeah, I, um, in my undergraduate studies, I won best senior thesis. So uh, after I won this, I was invited to come in and to uh, speak, you know, present my thesis, you know, kind of explain it to all of these visiting professors and everything. But the day before the presentation, I had had my wisdom teeth taken out. Um, and usually I'm pretty good at public speaking and just winging it, so I didn't prepare any remarks because I wrote the thesis. I just, you know, I planned on going up there and telling, I, I think partially the result of whatever drugs I was on after the wisdom teeth, I basically went up there and just immediately began to bleed from my mouth, <laughs> which is mostly normal, right, after a surgery like that, except all of a sudden I realized that I like, wow, that is a lot of blood. <laughs> but there were some pretty important professors there, so I just went on. I made a joke about it, like, got blood. And the way the auditorium's set up, there's this little well in the floor for the lectern, but there's no lectern there at the moment, so I get this idea in my head that I'll, that I'll just stand there and bleed into the well, and that they'll be able to use the... It's stupid saying it now, but use the blood for some sort of transfusion or something. I don't know, I'm gay anyway, so which... I, anyway, um, it ends up flooding the auditorium it fills up so much that it like runs over the lectern well and eventually the doors come off their hinges and everyone gets totally soaked. Like The Shining. My advisor is there with this pitying look and he's like wiping the blood off his glasses. So weird. People were pretty horrified or whatever. I couldn't quite tell from where I was sitting. Did, did we get at all pinkish during that one? <laughs> and we didn't, we didn't. Okay, in your minds, imagine what that would have been like, but maybe it turned pink at one point. <laughs> and it wasn't exactly, exactly word for word. Uh, great, so um, this, this, is, this is our last song, is it? This is the last, it's not the last thing, it's not the last event, but it is the last song. Uh, no pressure. It's one of my favorite. Uh, this, I think, also comes from that wedding show that we did. Uh, I know that uh, it comes from me interviewing my friend in Los Angeles. And I don't think it was an actual interview. I think I was just talking to her. And I knew I had this wedding show going on. I was like, wait, start over again. Let me get a recorder. Uh, and, uh, and Rebecca here uh, wrote it into this song, uh, and this is The Land. Uh, so back in the 70s, in the area of Northern California where I live, there was a bunch of hippies who decided to do this kind of back-to-the-land movement. 
and they moved all their families and their friends and everything out to the middle of nowhere to this place that they refer to as the land. Of course, of course they call it the land. And a few years ago, a friend of mine went out there and she was spending some time on the land and she met a guy and they decided to get married. Did you ever go back? No, I never went back. I was like, yeah, that's enough for me. Did you ever go back? No, I never went back. Oh, I never went back to the land. And I thought, I'll go to this wedding, sure. You know, a weekend in the country sounds nice. But we started getting emails, and it became apparent pretty soon that we were going to have to do a bunch of shit. Could you bring this pot or pan? Could you bring a sleeping bag? And you also need a sleeping pad and all these things to put yourself up. Also, you need stuff to eat. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner for however many days you're on the land. And then we started getting more emails, and it became apparent really soon that not only were we feeding ourselves for the weekend, we were catering the dinner. Could you bring 10 pounds of chicken? Could you bring four dozen eggs? Can you basically go out and spend like $500 at the grocery store and fill up your car and just bring it on up to the land? So we decided to rent a minivan, myself and the friends that I went with, Jake and Kathy, and we drive and we drive and we drive and we drive. And we drive 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 out to the middle of nowhere to the place that they refer to as the land and right away like out of central casting there's this totally controlling uptight hippie woman in charge of the kitchen <laughs> and it's no you can't put that there you can't put that there you need to put this here these are the vegan cutting boards these are the vegan knives it's actually very complicated it takes forever to learn it's like you're stepping into some kind of complicated psych experiment and it's a setup to fail and that's when Jake is like, well, see you later, ladies. I'm going to go hang out with the guys. <laughs> and that's when hippie rule number one starts to kick in, which is, well, the women folk are going to gather in the kitchen. And the guys, they're going to do their thing outside. And Kathy and I are like, this is bullshit. And we spend the whole day in the kitchen cooking. And that night, I can't find my sleeping bag and someone took my sleeping pad and a little girl wet her sleeping bag and guess whose sleeping bag that was? And maybe someone touched me in the middle of the night. Nope, it turns out that the place is just full of mice. And then at 6.30 a.m. someone comes in with a bell and starts ringing it. Like, get up, we wake up early on the land. And all the women trudge over to the kitchen and spend the whole day cooking again. Kathy was calling it wedding work camp. <laughs> but eventually, you know, we go outside and there's a tree and we all gather in a circle and they start the ceremony. And during the ceremony, like during the vows, this uh, guy in the second row starts like speaking out, like interrupting them. Like, oh, wow, that is so cool. You guys are like joining, man. Like that, like super loud. <laughs> and oh, man, forever, that's a long time. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And I'm like, OK, that guy is absolutely tripping. He's peeking at the wedding ceremony. And somebody went over and was like, Dustin, man, be more chill. But it just went on for like the whole time. <laughs> but they pronounce the man and wife. And we head back to the house. And the hippie ladies are like, let's get the meal out. And I'm like, ask that guy and that guy and that guy. But I am sitting down and I am eating now. We got a lot of flack for that. We got a lot of grief for not also agreeing to be the waitresses. A lot of dirty looks from sky and petal. <laughs> but we ate and we had a good time. And then after dinner, they start this fire pit ritual thing. And the guy from before, the tripping guy, is like, I'm jumping over the fire. I'm going to jump over that fire. And we're like, Dustin Mann may not be such a good idea, but he wouldn't listen, and he tripped, and he fell in the fire. 
It's like, I can't believe I'm laughing, but it's like, now we have a medical emergency. And we need someone who's completely sober, who can drive in and out of here in the dark in a car, and somehow find a hospital on the land. It took a very long time to find that person. And then we found out two years later that they didn't even really get married because they actually don't believe in it as like a legal thing and there's nothing wrong with that but i find it curious <laughs> and now they're divorced did you ever go back no i never went back i was like yeah that's enough for me oh did you ever go back no i never went back oh i never went back to the land Beautiful, thank you, thank you, Rebecca. Oh, am I still on? I'm on. Good, good, good. Okay, uh, we are up in the home stretch now, uh, and we're gonna we're gonna visit one of our stories one more time. If you've been keeping track, you know which story that is. It's Adele and the cake. Uh, but we uh, we need to do a little um, uh, scene shift here. Just a little. We're just gonna do a little theatrical embellishment. Uh, so we, if we had a curtain, we would bring it down and then change stuff behind it, but we don't. Um, so I'm just gonna ask all of you to close your eyes. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Josh over here will play some music. Don't open them while you know, all the music is playing, but when the music ends, it's safe to open your eyes again, okay? Everyone clear on the instructions? Yeah. Okay, so starting now, close your eyes. chocolate cakes and then stacking them two layers of chocolate two layers of homemade cookies mandel bread just a schwartz schwartzwalder kushtort day with with a little chocolate swirls on top oh and we put it on that beautiful crystal plate that we got for our wedding the one my aunt gave us your son here was no help of course but you know that's okay it doesn't matter I'm the good daughter-in-law and she loves chocolate and it's her birthday so what I the fuck is this <laughs> uh, Ru Ruth uh, Ruth did you say something what is this shit um, uh, Ruth we're downstairs and so we can't hear you so well it's uh, Disgusting! Um, uh, Ruth, why don't you come downstairs? We're getting ready to light the candles. Yeah! Uh, 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 Bob, do you want to go upstairs and see if your mom is okay? Uh, Terry, do you want to check on your wife? All right, fine, fine. I'll do it. Uh, Ma, ha happy birthday. What? Did you do? Well, I just I just came from downstairs and I was What is that thing? Oh yeah. I know it, it looks like a lot really, but it, it's an eight layer chocolate cake. I baked every layer individually on my own. Um you I know you love chocolate and it's your birthday, so I, I asked for a chocolate pie! Oh, um, Yes, but you can't really put candles in a pie, so I thought I would If just... I wanted a chocolate fucking cake, I would have asked for a chocolate fucking cake, you idiot! Okay, all right, I just want you to take a deep breath, okay? I promise next time I will make you a chocolate pie. I will really... Get this no, abomination no, 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 no. out of my house! That is a crystal After plate! That is from I my wedding shower! And Please, Ruth, don't do that! Don't do that! Don't do that! Don't do that! What is wrong with you? I'll get it! <laughs> Why don't you make yourself useful for once and clean up your mess? <laughs> oh, hi! Hi, come on in! No, no, you're right on time. We're just cleaning up a bit. <gasps> oh, is that cake? <laughs> you're so sweet. How thoughtful! <gasps> it looks 
looks beautiful. Scene. <laughs>